What's up, fam? We are back with another video. Today, we're continuing on with uh, part two of the Napoleonic Wars. Um, really enjoyed part one. Excited for part two uh, to see, you know, how uh, this story concludes itself, Napoleon's story, and how he gets the pose and what happens. But uh, before that, let's do a quick recap of part one. So in part one, um, we learned uh, that Napoleon was originally born in the island of Corsica. Um, the island of Corsica was a former territory of the Republic of Genoa, and then uh, it got uh, that territory, the Republic of Genoa sold uh, the island of Corsica to the, uh, to the French, and that's how Napoleon pretty much came to be French. Um, and then he went to military school in France. Uh, however, uh, because of the way society was, he was, you know, he was unable to really move up in the military. Uh, he was hard pressed to move up because of how rigid uh, the social hierarchies were, because you had, because you have like, you know, the clergy, the nobility, and everyone else. And because of those rigid, the rigid, the rigidness of the social strata, uh, he couldn't really move up in the military. So because of that, he took to, to the ideas of the French Revolution, uh, which wanted to sort of uh, you know, undo all, uh, all of that. Um, and then um, he s slowly started to make his uh, name in the uh, French military be by putting down uh, counter-revolutions and, and royalist uprisings, right? And I think in the, in the first video I said that he was putting down, uh, he was, you know, protecting France against invading forces and holding in invading forces back. That wasn't completely accurate. The first um, the way that he originally gained notoriety in the French military was by, by putting down these, uh, you know, insurrections and, and revolutions and, and these royalist uprisings. Um, and then eventually he solidified his standing and popularity in the French army by, uh, with his victories against the Austrian army in the, um, war of the first coalition. So obviously, you know, France was surrounded, you know, there was a bunch of European monarchies, right? And France was surrounded by monarchies. And obviously they didn't take too kindly to, you know, the, the, the French overthrowing their own monarchies. They don't want the idea spreading around Europe that it's okay to, you know, to, 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 to overthrow the monarchy and have those the, the ideas of the French Revolution promulgated throughout Europe. So they declared war on France and which led to a bunch of coalition wars and and because of his actions during the first coalition war that's what really solidified napoleon uh in the eyes of the french uh as being sort of like a great general and all that and eventually napoleon ended up teaming up with his brother lucien bonaparte and uh, emmanuel joseph Sayas to overthrow the current government that you know wasn't too popular uh, they established the first uh, the they established the consulate the consulate but uh, napoleon uh, really you know wrote the constitution or the 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 uh, forming document uh, to really put himself in charge as the first consul uh, so he was the only one in charge really and then later on he, he came to name himself you know supreme god emperor and whatever and he was a dictator pretty much uh, and he was the uh, one and and the only one in power the only one with real power the only one with sole control of the country and then uh, tensions in Europe persist, obviously. Uh, and then uh, we had the second, third, and fourth coalition wars, with which Napoleon uh, won all for all, you know, all of those wars, pretty much. So that's where we left uh, left it off in, in part um, in part one, uh, with rising tensions again with the French and the British, and continuing tensions in Europe. Uh, well, pretty much France. Uh, pretty much against everybody. So it's amazing that France was able to hold its own against all these other European powers. You're talking about Austria, you're talking about uh, Russia, Prussia, and the British, and French, and the French were able to hold their own against all these other armies around it. So without any further ado, let's dive into part two. So I hope you have your berets on, hope you have your croissant, your eclairs, your baguettes, your wine, because we're about to dive into the Napoleonic Wars part two. Let's get it. After the third and fourth coalition wars, Napoleon had decisively defeated all three of his main rivals on the continent. And he was now undoubtedly the master 
of Europe. Master After the of Battle Europe. of Friedland, his enemies sued for peace, and they all met on a raft on a river for negotiations. They had been fighting for the past four years, but now Napoleon and Alexander surprisingly got along like a house on fire. They oh, laughed oh, together. Oh, oh. They chatted long into the night. They kissed. The two what? Had they a kissed? Lot of respect, and Napoleon even told his wife oh, that whoa. if Alexander were a woman, I would make him my mistress. What? Kind of a weird thing to say to your wife, Napoleon. In the end, they came to an amicable agreement. Russia hey, lose barely nothing wrong with that. Napoleon's doors they swung both ways. The UK and invade Sweden. Win-win. On the other hand, Frederick William III was sidelined, and Prussia lost an enormous amount of territory to French client states. Only the UK remained as the last major threat to Napoleon, and they continued to be a big thorn in his side, constantly funding his enemies and using their powerful navy to wreak havoc on French trade mm. and overseas colonies. But what could Napoleon do? The Kay was doing everything safe across the channel. Funding. Said, if I can't fight you with guns, I'll fight you. Other people to fight money. him. Proxy Early wars. In 1806, Napoleon had announced the Continental System, a total shutoff of the UK from continental trade. Oh wow! No one in Europe was to trade with Britain, and Napoleon hoped that by hitting their economy, he could force them to negotiate. And wanted to the choke British them out. did take a hit, and they responded in their typical fashion by going to Copenhagen and blowing a bunch of stuff up. But in general, the British managed to stay afloat by simply increasing their trade with other parts of the world. Mm. Many neutral countries found themselves across the Atlantic in a hard place as the two European superpowers demanded they cease trade with the enemy. Hey, America, you better not trade with the French or else I'll come burn down the White House. What? This is going to wreck my economy. I need to start saving money. How the heck am I going to start saving money? Making peace with the Russians, a continental blockade and blowing up Copenhagen. Sick of being blown up for doing almost nothing. And under significant pressure from Napoleon, the Danish officially sided with France. Mm, Napoleon's right. blockade had the biggest effect on continental Europe, who were now cut off from a major trading partner, one that controlled the seas and held a rich, growing empire. Mm. And a lot of countries double edged sword. Comply. Portugal, a traditional British ally, refused to take part. No problem. Napoleon sent an army and invaded. But it wasn't just Portugal, many of Napoleon's allies were also suspect. Your Majesty. It seems that Spain isn't properly enforcing your blockade. Spain? Why not? Well, it appears they've been trying to find a way out of being your ally since they lost their fleet at Trafalgar. What is with these people? It's almost like everyone's only pretending to be my ally because they know otherwise I'd beat them up. Oh, the country started to turn. Any real friends? Are you my friend? Against Peter? Napoleon. Say yes, or I'll slap you. Napoleon had come to mistrust his ally to the south, and in particular, Napoleon thought the Spanish royal family were an incompetent mess. All right, Carlos, you've got to get it together. How can I trust you when all you do is go hunting? Meanwhile, you let this ambitious nobody who dislikes me run the country. And you seem to be the only person in the universe who doesn't realize he's boinking your wife. And what's worse, who the heck are you? I'm the king's son. I just overthrew my dad. So actually, now I'm the king. You people are the biggest cluster of shameless, narcissistic idiots and all around just the worst people I've ever met. Here, have a Kid's Choice Award. French forces, many having conveniently already entered Spain to invade Portugal, uh, occupy... So, real quick here to point out, this is what I mean by Napoleon doing an about-face in terms of his ideals, right? Because, again, he originally supported the uh, French Revolution, but here he is, one, establishing himself as, you know, supreme overlord, and two being friendly with the spanish monarchy making peace with the other monarchies uh in europe and allying with alexander and all that so like his it's it's like uh he obviously he didn't really truly believe in those ideas it's only what served him at the time right it didn't serve him that he couldn't move up in the military so the you know the ideas of the french revolution would allow him to do that so he sided with that but then once he got into power he he said hey you know what this being a monarch thing isn't too bad let me be emperor and here you see him being all cozy and cozy and buddy buddy with uh, the other uh you know european monarchs when they become his allies so that's you know something to note about napoleon is that i don't think he ever, ever really believed in you know the the whole equality and you know uh you know fraternity and all the other stuff that the french revolution was about um another thing i wanted to say is that if if you guys um no when i'm doing these reactions sometimes it's uh hard to you know it throws a lot at you so to ingest all the information that is 
throwing at you and and I'm trying to react out loud and share my thoughts in real time. So if I do miss anything, uh, feel free to, to know, just put it in the comments. And if you do know something uh, that's important that maybe the oversimplified video uh, doesn't uh, mention or something that's interesting, also please feel free to put it in the comments. I'm sure it'll benefit me and obviously anyone else who watches this video and looks at, looks at the comments. So thanks for doing this up. So with that, Let's dive back in. Hide Spanish forts, and Napoleon invited the Spanish royals to France to help mediate their differences. All right, we're here with the royal family of Spain. So, Fernando, you've been accused of plotting against your father and vying for the Spanish throne. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, Napoleon, I That's just think we're right. Well, I've got the test results right here. Fernando, in the case of the Spanish throne, you are not the king. <laughs> And Carlos, you are also not the king. Oh, okay. Remove them from power? He I'm made himself king. king of Spain? Damn. Actually, Napoleon made his brother the king. Oh, okay. For all intents and purposes, Spain was now his, his puppet. puppet. Yeah, pretty he much. expected the Spanish people to be over the moon at the removal of their unpopular royal family. Yeah, then they liked Imagine that. Imagine his surprise when it turned out that people don't really like to be subjugated by a foreign power. Exactly. Well, one who had previously attacked the Catholic Church. And so the people of Spain and when he smacked the pope. Brutal fighting broke Ooh. out as bands of armed Spaniards ambushed French troops across the kingdom and vicious atrocities. Oh, Napoleon fucked up. Sides. In addition to fighting the regular Spanish and Portuguese forces, the French had to contend with tens of thousands of guerrilla fighters throughout the Spanish countryside. The British even took the opportunity to land an army led by the future Duke of Wellington. And now, British forces were defeating French ones on land. Napoleon briefly went to Spain in person, and he did drive back the Allied armies. But before long, his attention was needed elsewhere. The whole thing oh. became a nightmare for the Started Emperor. starting to unravel for a boy here. Warfare. But this was something more akin to Napoleon. He caused the Spanish Adam. uprising, the and the British took of advantage. And resources bogged down for years. Napoleon was never able to break the will of the Spanish people. Wow. And this problem weakened his position in Europe. <laughs> hey, Francis. Want to go to war with Napoleon again? Oh, I don't know, Britain. He's already whomped me three times. I'll give you a bazillion pounds. <laughs> well, okay. Seeing that Napoleon was now caught up in Spain and with some British funding, Austria mm. decided maybe just uh, maybe Austria's back in the game. They'd have a chance. So did they? No. <laughs> Napoleon defeated them. Austria in still four sucks. Months. It was quick, but it wasn't exactly easy. The Austrians had been watching Napoleon and learning, and they had made some reforms. While Napoleon, after years of war, was increasingly having to rely on inexperienced conscripts. So mm. this time, the Austrians gave him a run for his money. The Fifth Coalition saw some of the Fifth bloodiest battles to date, including Napoleon's first major defeat. And when he did finally defeat the Austrians at the Battle of Wagram, it was a very costly victory. Wearing him Instead, down. Napoleon had yet again kicked Francis's butt, and as part of the peace terms, Austria lost a bunch more land. Not long after, however, Napoleon and Francis came to another agreement. It was decided that Napoleon would marry Francis's young daughter. But wait, Whoa. doesn't Napoleon already have a wife? Well, yes, he did. Josephine and Napoleon had become quite fond of one another. But oh, really? Napoleon was playing the monarch game. He needed a male heir, and his aging wife wasn't giving him one. So it was out with the old and in with the new. At least he didn't behead anyone. For Austria, they felt that if Napoleon was going to keep on winning, they may as well be on his side. Hmm. So through the marriage, Napoleon got an alliance with Austria and a beautiful baby potato. <laughs> Between the failing blockade against Britain, the ongoing war in Spain, and now his recent struggles in Austria, cracks in Napoleon's invincibility were beginning to show. Yeah, him. cracks still, in the armor. Look at this map. So blue. It's so really beautiful. blue. Even Sweden, after being pulverized by Russia, overthrew their king, and after an interesting chain of events, ended up putting one of Napoleon's own marshals in charge. Wow. Marshal Bernadotte took the name Karl Johan and became Crown Prince of Sweden after agreeing to join wow. Napoleon's continental system. For now, Sweden was Team France. Napoleon was on top of the world. He had won an endless string of victories. All he had to do now was sit back and not make Ignore any this. calculations that could completely turn the tide of war. Uh -oh. So let's see He's what comes about next. to mess up again. Napoleon's invasion. Invading Russia France is never France really a Russia great idea a for anyone. Prospect. Together, the two could have been unstoppable. But unfortunately, the alliance didn't last. The Russians felt they weren't getting a fair deal. Napoleon's Duchy of Warsaw right on their doorstep was a bit of an insult. And then their economy began to tank because of Napoleon's British blockade. 
and eventually they began to open up trade. Your Majesty, it seems Alexander is no longer abiding by the continental system and has begun trading with the British. Alexander? But he kissed me. He kissed you? You wouldn't get it, Pierre. No one would ever kiss you. <laughs> the security of Napoleon's empire depended on removing the British threat, and yeah. he wasn't happy with Russia's backdoor shenanigans. And so in 1812, Napoleon decided to go to war. He gathered together the most massive army Europe had ever seen, made up of troops wow. from every corner. Wow, six hundred and fifty thousand men to invade. Invading Russia is coming for us, General. One, I need ideas. We could start almost impossible. No, that's stupid. You're stupid. We could run away. You, you're a star. At least it's never Napoleon's easy. Tactics relied on astonishing speed to outmaneuver his enemy and force a quick, decisive battle. Well, I've got two words for you: scorched earth. If his opponent retreated while scorching the earth, his men couldn't live off the land. And if his men couldn't live off the land, he needed his supply trains. And if he needed his supply trains, he couldn't move quickly. And if he couldn't move quickly, he couldn't outmaneuver his enemy. And if he couldn't outmaneuver his enemy, I think you get the point. Napoleon launched his invasion and hoped for a quick mm -hmm. battle. But all he could do was try to catch the retreating Russians while moving deeper and deeper into hostile territory. Right. As he went, the horribly hot summer devastated hot his, summer. his men died of heat, exhaustion, and disease. At least it wasn't winter time. To run out and his men began to starve. Many deserted, and still the Russians continued to retreat. Numerous times, Napoleon considered turning back, but that little voice in his head kept on telling him, keep going, just a little further. It might be a trap. And don't worry. Because it might Definitely circle back. Height for the time. He nearly caught the Russians at Smolensk, but it was his birthday, so he had a party instead. When he finally reached Moscow, oh, he, he did reach Moscow. Russians wouldn't be willing to give up such a historic and holy city without a fight, and he, was right. The Russians finally turned to face him for the single deadliest day of the Napoleonic Wars, the Battle Ooh. of Borodino. The Russians fought valiantly, and as he got older, Napoleon's battle tactics seemed to become a little less refined and a little more run straight at the enemy, try not to die. He launched a full frontal assault at the Russian defenses, and as a result, the death toll was colossal. Ooh. The Russians eventually decided to retreat, leaving Moscow. They gave up Moscow. Napoleon's wow, hands. Moscow, Ma uh, Moscow fell. Release all these prisoners immediately and tell them to burn it to the ground. Well, well, Jimmy the arsonist, you are not going to believe your luck. Moscow went up in flames, and as Napoleon entered, it became very clear his army wouldn't be able to stay there very long. But he had just defeated the Russian army and taken their most beloved city. In his mind, he had won. So he sent Tsar Alexander in St. Petersburg. A you would think so. Your Imperial Majesty, Napoleon requests your surrender. How shall I respond? You shan't, Dmitri. Ever? Ever. But, Your Majesty, it will be winter soon. The French forces are stuck 500 miles into Russian territory with dwindling supplies. Yeah. Don't say anything. Well, then they'll all die. Oh! <laughs> After waiting for a response, you gotta get out of there before the winter. Winter began to fall. Yep. Napoleon sensed that that's the thing about Russia. Was about to unfold, he decided their only choice now was to get the out. elements, or as much as a defense as the men, got as cold. the Russians. Stupid cold. His glorious invasion had just become a race for survival. As the Russians realized the French were fleeing for their lives, uh -oh. they began to close in on their supply line. Yep. The men froze to death. Their horses as well. There was starvation and disease. The injured and dying could only be left by the side of the road as it was too slow to try to carry them. And all along the way, the dreaded Russian Cossacks stalked the bleeding French army and every now and then swept in for a quick attack. Napoleon, fearing capture, kept a vial of poison around his neck. At one point, the Russian Ow. armies nearly trapped him against the Berezina River. But a little Napoleon... You'd rather go out than be captured. Jew, Respect. ...tricking them into thinking he was going south, and then escaping across rapidly built pontoon bridges to the north. When oh, the Russians the realized pontoon where bridges. he was and began to close in, the French burned the bridges before everyone could cross. Hundreds drowned, and thousands were captured. At this point, Napoleon got wind of plots against him forming in Paris, so he abandoned his men and went back to France. The remaining French Damn. stragglers made it across the border. It's been estimated over 600,000 men went into Russia. How much came out? Less than 100,000 returned. Napoleon was now in a very serious situation. His army had just been obliterated and the other European leaders smelled blood. Here was an opportunity to take advantage of a weakened Napoleon, regain territory and influence, and liberate Europe from his dirty French paws. And so they began to turn. Prussia soon broke their alliance and switched sides. Alexander, I thought we had something. Neutrality. Even Sweden, led by one of Napoleon's old marshals, joined the Allies, partly due to Napoleon's earlier invasion of Swedish Pomerania. 
The War of the Sixth Coalition. Oh, another had coalition begun. war. The coalition Damn. forces had been reforming their armies. How many of these are we gonna have? <laughs> and the UK had also significantly amped up its financial they aid up their war to chest. its continental allies. Their armies quickly oh, aid to its allies. through Poland and into Germany. In Paris, Napoleon was understandably freaking out. He needed to put together a new army fast, and he called up over a hundred thousand new conscripts, mostly teenagers. He also put his factories into overdrive. And he was like, you, make more rifles. You, build new cannons. You, make more horses. I don't make horses. Then who makes horses? Horses make horses. Explain how. Well, when a daddy horse and a mommy horse love each other very much. Yes, go on. Well, then the daddy horse. I'm sorry, Napoleon. You're 43. I thought you'd know this stuff. Don't touch me. I'm gonna be sick. As it turned out, Napoleon's lack of horses would take the biggest toll on his army, since his tactics relied on speed, maneuverability, and destruction. Mm. When he took the fight to the Allies in 1813, he did defeat them and sent them running. But lacking cavalry, he was unable to effectively pursue and destroy. He needed horses. For the Allies, being defeated in battle by a man whose army was now full of inexperienced conscripts was concerning. So both sides were like, hold up, time out. The Allies were somewhat cornered, and had Napoleon kept going, it's possible he could have won. Oh, so but instead, he agreed to a brief truce uh, with the Austrians. Why would he agree to this truce? Sides. When Austria demanded Napoleon make major concessions, Napoleon told them to shove it. Having had their terms rejected, Austria felt now they were justified in saying, well, we tried, and they joined the coalition. Ooh, okay, everyone, yeah. look at us. The boys are back together. Everyone's so flipping Napoleon again. Napoleon is still dangerous, so we need a plan. Any ideas? Hmm. Ooh, I know. Ah, uh, no, forget it. That's stupid. Ah! Uh, oh, uh, no, 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 no. I've got it! When he approaches, we run away. Also, the, this yes. guy that's the... The plan was uh, as follows. Wherever Napoleon advanced, Crown Prince of Sweden now was a former French, battle, uh, you know, from the sides, and I guess general or whatever. His flanks. So it's interesting to see him going against Napoleon like now. Napoleon. And this plan worked tremendously. The Allies scored a number of victories that saw Napoleon move back to the city of Leipzig, where he would make one last major stand as the Allied armies converged in on him from all sides. The stage was set for the biggest and bloodiest battle of the Napoleonic Wars, the Battle of Leipzig. Leipzig. Almost half a million troops from over a dozen nations stretched across the battlefield. The French found themselves fighting on all sides for four days against the Austrians, Prussians, Swedes, and Russians. It's no wonder this battle is also sometimes referred to as the Battle of the Nations. The French fought ferociously, but ultimately were no match for the coordinated efforts of the coalition. At one point, in the midst of battle, Saxon troops allied with the French had a team huddle and were like, hey guys, I'm pretty sure the French are losing. Let's switch sides. What? So they did. Wow, when so much betrayal in this. Win, so many the switching the sides. River, the Allies swarmed into the city and desperate fighting raged in the streets. Okay, Corporal, after everyone has crossed the river, I need you to blow up the bridge. Okay? Not before everyone's crossed, after. You got that? Yes, Colonel. I'm not five. Pause. I can comprehend. So this is what happens when you have an army that's not really tied by, uh, uh, you know, a, a shared identity or they, they don't have a shared heritage or shared nationality, right? Because you have, and it's kind of a loosely tied coalition, uh, you know, yeah, especially when, you know, they're, you know, you're, they're allied with uh, with you because you're, you're a conqueror or whatever, and they're on your side because you invaded them and, and took over. You see what happens. So you have one, uh, Alexander, which um we know uh was only allied to napoleon after they sued for peace and they signed a treaty or whatever but he did previously been enemies right so him switching sides again isn't that surprising uh you have um the austrians and francis uh obviously they have a long history with the front being uh antagonistic with, with with the french um so him flipping not not super surprising and then you have obviously the ten the, what what happened with spain and um and carl johan which is which is a former frenchman essentially being it was a, was put as the crown prince of sweden by napoleon but then switched and went against napoleon and then you had the saxons who they're not really french so when the french started losing they're, they're like hey let's switch the winning side so 
everybody's flipping and betraying on each other and switching sides and it's and that's what happens when you have a loosely built coalition right when you have an army that's not really uh you know an army they're allied because of convenience or they were just on the winning team it's easy for them to switch sides especially if they have bad blood in their history so that's why napoleon's army um started to kind of like fall apart a little bit uh, Napoleon's coalition started to fall apart a little bit uh, because of these, you know, these loose ties that sort of held them, held held it together. Time. Good. Wait, did he say before or after? Well, fortune favors the bold. The bridge was blown early, and thirty thousand French troops were stranded and captured. A disaster. And with that, you also have a bunch of beginning to come mishaps on, Napoleon. on Napoleon's army. South, an army under the on their side Biden had been pushing the French out of Spain for the past few years and were now crossing into France. Austrian armies had pushed into Italy while Napoleon's old flamboyant cavalry commander Murat, who Napoleon had made king of Naples, decided to switch sides. All German switching sides. He resentful after years under Napoleon's thumb, turned against him and the Confederation of the Rhine collapsed. Bernard wow. invaded Denmark and they were forced to join the coalition. Former generals were liberated. Switching Napoleon sides. might have seen the writing on the wall, but he was Napoleon. And so instead, he prepared to keep fighting. As attitudes in Paris were already beginning to turn against him, all his people turned on him to defend the exhausted nation. As for the Allies, they weren't sure exactly what they were aiming for here. A few peace offers were floated that may have let Napoleon keep his position, but the British kept throwing around even more money, and eventually, they all agreed that the ultimate aim was the deposition of Napoleon. Got deposed. Entirely. And so, Napoleon embarked on one of his most famous campaigns to defend the homeland. He was completely outnumbered, but the Allied armies had split up and spread out. His army was so small that he could move at lightning oh, speed. Oh, we know Napoleon likes that speed. Advantage. In the famous six days campaign against Prussian General Blücher, Don't tell me he won. from all directions and defeated Blücher's forces four times. Wow. Only suffering a tenth of the casualties he inflicted. Even with his back completely to the wall, Napoleon was still Napoleon. He, he was still a tactical genius. To take on Schwarzenberg's army of Bohemia and enjoyed even more victories. However, Napoleon's problem was that he couldn't be everywhere at once, and wherever he wasn't, the Allies continued to push towards Paris. He made one last ditch attempt at moving in behind the enemy lines and cutting off their communications, but Paris was in disarray, and the people were sick of war. One ambitious and slightly treacherous politician sent the Allied armies a letter basically saying, Hey guys, come on in. And so wow. they did. The city's defenders surrendered, and as the Allied leaders entered Paris, the people cheered them as bringers of peace. Paris had fallen. So many Wait, Judases marshals, gather your men in our ranks. An assault on Paris. Where are my marshals? So many moles. Left and told me to give you this note. And yeah, his marshals left them. Napoleon's marshals abandoned them. What he hadn't. It was over, and they insisted all that was left now for the good of France was for him to abdicate. And without the support of his army, Napoleon had no choice. He hoped his son could take his place, but it was decided instead to restore the old Bourbon monarchy. Wow, King Louis would become the king of France. King Louis the Sixteenth's like brother. The French Revolution had never even happened. But what Damn. we do with Napoleon? We can't have a hyperactive forty-four-year-old menace running around reigniting revolutionary ideals and plotting his return. Well, why don't we send him? Mm, I don't know. There, the location chosen for Napoleon's exile was the small island of Elba, just off the coast of Italy. Napoleon was to rule over the island and even got to keep the title Emperor of Elba. The Emperor Allies of Elba? Stitches when they came up with that. When he learned what his fate was to be, he drank the poison he had been keeping around his neck, but it had gone out of date. Oh so instead no. Of a painless death, he got a painful stummy wummy instead. Before he left France, he addressed his oldest and closest guard one last time, making an emotional speech that ended with him kissing their flag. And off he went to exile. He went to the exile. was given to him was actually quite generous. His family were given titles. He was to receive a state pension from France. He wasn't he beheaded. He received many distinguished visitors, all eager to come and meet the famed emperor. And he ruled over Elba well, improving infrastructure and introducing many legal and social reforms. Wow. He, he was great at governance. Hey, Napoleon, just coming in to check on how it's all going. Holy smokes. But it wasn't all good. For one thing, he learned of the death of his first wife, Josephine, and was deeply saddened. 
He was forbidden from seeing his son and current wife, and in Austria, Emperor Francis had ordered a local count to seduce her, so she would forget about Napoleon. Then, the new King Louis XVIII refused to give Napoleon his agreed pension. He was under constant threat of assassination, and there were even rumors that the Allies were thinking of relocating him somewhere even more remote. But Damn. the biggest problem was that Napoleon was once the master of Europe. Yeah, it's hard to go from that life to adventure, this. Fame and glory. Now, he found himself on a tiny island in the Mediterranean, and he was bored. Wouldn't it be nice if he could somehow return to France and reclaim his throne? Uh -oh. Hey, Napoleon, want to go back to France and reclaim your throne? Getting ideas in your head. But how? Well, I was thinking we could just take this boat. Will that work? Surprisingly, yes. Pierre, remember when I told you no one would ever kiss you? Yes, sire. Well, pucker up, boyo. Yay. When Napoleon left Elba, it wasn't really the daring escape you might think. He basically had kind of a leaving ceremony, hopped on a ship, and sailed back to France. He brought with him an army of about a thousand men, and he began his journey to Paris. However, in Paris, there was now a new king, and at first, the people largely accepted him because the last few years of war under Napoleon had brought immense death and economic suffering. That's right, the king is back, baby. Divine right to rule. Don't worry, everyone. Still got the Ferrari. The economy is kaput, but I and my courtiers will withdraw into this palace, and we will definitely work as hard as we can to fix everything. Yep, I'm sure. Oh yeah, that's why we got rid of the king. Yep. As the Bourbon monarchy began to look more and more like a return to the past, and the returning nobility. It's amazing that after all this. Privileges. The people. It's almost like the French Revolution never so, happened. Napoleon hoped that his glorious return would be met with jubilation. In the end, the reaction was a little mixed, but many were happy to see their old emperor. Your Majesty, it seems that Napoleon is back and marching this way with a thousand men. That guy? No problem. I have hundreds of thousands of men. Send them to arrest him. Uh, Your Majesty, it seems the thousands of men we sent to arrest Napoleon have all joined his side. Oh. Well, I'm off to Belgium. If you ever need a king again, be sure to let me know. As Napoleon continued his journey, the king had sent battalions of men to stop him, but they largely comprised of Napoleon's old soldiers, many unhappy with King Louis's military reforms. And so, when ordered to arrest him, they, they simply couldn't do it. In one famous incident, the troops began to cry out, Long live the emperor. When Napoleon reached Paris, with King Louis having fled, he entered unopposed to reclaim his throne. Napoleon was back from the dead. Oh, wow. Okay, everyone, now that we've finally gotten rid of that guy, let's try to make sure something like this can never happen again. What's that doing there? Hey, fellow monarchs. Just like that, he's back. Basically, came back and took this his throne Napoleon unopposed. Be a mucho, mucho good boy and not start any wars. But the Allied leaders were having none of it. They declared Napoleon an outlaw and the illegitimate ruler of France. Then they declared war, not on France, but on Napoleon himself. And when you have multiple huh? empires declaring war on you as an individual, that's how you know you're a very nice Has that boy. ever happened the before? Powers began making plans to combine Where countries declare war on a person? France. The most immediate threat to Napoleon were the British and Prussians hanging out in nearby Belgium. If Napoleon could knock them out quickly, maybe he could force the Allies to negotiate, and maybe he could hold on to his power. Together, the two armies to the north outnumbered him, so he made a plan to divide them and take them on separately. Historians debate how much of a chance Napoleon had here, but this same strategy of dividing and conquering had worked for him multiple times. He marched north with 125,000 men and took on the Allies in a number of initial engagements, defeating the Prussians before turning to take on the British. But to Napoleon's dismay, miscommunication and hesitation among his marshals allowed both enemy armies to retreat. And crucially, rather than fleeing east, the Prussians moved north, where they could remain in contact with the British. Napoleon sent a force to hold off the Prussians as he moved in on the British, now holding a defensive position at Waterloo. Prussian General Blücher sent word that he would come to Wellington's aid if he could just hold off the French for long enough. Napoleon had to defeat Wellington before the Prussian army could arrive in force, mm. and it was close. The British held the high ground and a number of key defensive buildings across the battlefield. After waiting some hours he didn't have for the ground to dry, Napoleon sent men to assault the Hougoumont farm, but the British German garrison there held out. 
French Marshal Ney launched a number of miscalculated cavalry charges at the British lines. The British formed defensive square formations, and they tore the French cavalry to shreds. While one guy chose the absolute worst time to go on a bender. The French did manage to capture a farmhouse directly in front of the British line. And from there, they unleashed artillery hellfire on the British square formations. And as Napoleon sent his Imperial Guard in to finish the British off, a nervous Wellington knew his lines were at breaking point. But the Prussians had earlier begun to arrive, and now they were arriving in large numbers. Oh. And after the British held out and sent the French Imperial Guard running, they getting the encircled. Panicked, fearing they had been encircled, yep. they began to They're trying to flee now. The Battle of Waterloo was an Allied victory. And with that, Napoleon's hopes of returning to glory were vanquished. He knew mm. he was defeated. Just with he that. went to the British and said, Can I please have a house near London? And the British replied, Of course they were going to no. say no. Instead, to make sure Napoleon was put away once and for all, they sent him to one of the most isolated and remote places they could think of. A tiny island in the Atlantic Ocean. I'm surprised they just Saint Helena. didn't kill Here, him. A deeply isolated and depressed Emperor Napoleon would live the remaining years of his life. His house was a wooden bungalow, not exactly on par with the Tuileries Palace. Much to his frustration, his captors referred to him as general, rather than calling him emperor. His mail was censored, his visitors were vetted. There was almost no way he could escape such an isolated island. But just to be sure, he was guarded by 2,000 British soldiers and two ships that circled the island 24 hours a day. Damn. He had once been the most powerful man alive. And images of the victorious Napoleon depict a strong leader, hand firmly in jacket. Depictions of Napoleon on St. Helena show a disheveled old man, hand firmly in pants. He had lost everything. And by the way, he was only 46. 46. So maybe it's about time you, um, you know what? You're doing all right, kid. Napoleon fought one last battle while on the island. The battle for his reputation. He spent hours writing his memoirs, espousing his achievements, recording his greatness, and turning himself and his story into a phenomenal legend. And in this battle, he certainly succeeded. His mark on history cannot be denied. After his defeat, the European monarchs had got to work restoring Europe to its traditional balance and reasserting their dominance. Yep. But after Napoleon had spread the influence of the French Revolution, these returning monarchs would have a difficult time regaining their absolute control. Hmm. France returned to the rule of the Bourbons, but it would go on to stage another revolution and then another one. Reaction to Napoleon's rule in places like Germany and Italy propelled forward the ideas and feelings of modern unity and nationalism, and his Napoleonic code still remains the basis of law in various modern countries. Hmm. The modern world owes a lot to Napoleon's legacy. He remains statistically possibly the greatest military general in history, and his yeah. revolutionary military tactics changed the face of warfare. He was the last truly great leader to both lead his armies in battle while retaining total political control over a vast empire. There's still hope for Joe Biden, but the man remains somewhat of an enigma, and we still aren't sure exactly what to make of him in some regards. Was he the champion of the French Revolution, no. spreading equality wherever he went, no. or did he betray it by making himself an absolute monarch? Exactly. He made himself an absolute monarch. Was he an ambitious and aggressive conqueror, hellbent on bringing Europe to its knees? Or was he simply defending himself against an aggressive Europe, hellbent on reducing his power? Some things will continue to be debated. Napoleon died at the age of 51, officially of stomach cancer, but some believe he may have been poisoned. The British buried him in a tin coffin, inside a mahogany coffin, inside a lead coffin, Jeez. inside another mahogany they, coffin. They buried him like he was a vampire. They to make sure he stayed where they put him. In 1840, his remains were moved to Paris. They were where shook. They now rest under the dome of Les Invalides. The man from humble origins, with huge ambition, ruthless determination, immaculate skill on the battlefield, and a hefty dose of luck, who was determined to make his mark on history, did just that. There is no immortality, he said, but the memory that is left in the minds of men. And in that sense, Napoleon knew he would live on forever. Oh, and to reiterate, he was definitely average height for the time. All right, a uh, great uh, end to the Napoleonic Wars, great end to the series. And uh, yeah, it's interesting to see that after all of that, um, that pretty much by the by the time Napoleon was finally, uh, you know, 
deposed of and gotten rid of when, when he was sent to St. Helena, the island. Uh, it's almost like the French Revolution never happened. All those years kind of like wiped out. Another revolution eventually took place, but it, the, the first one was kind of undone essentially uh when they you know took out napoleon um the first time and put back king louis the 16th's brother in place and uh yeah but it, there's no doubt about it napoleon uh one of the greatest tactical minds greatest generals uh of all time and also what set him apart is not only just his tactical brilliance but also the the his aptitude for uh governance his political guile the way he was writing constitutions by uh, literally by himself or i mean i'm sure he had other people with him but writing constant having the, a strong hand and writing constitutions uh knowing how to lead politically um you know the adeptness that he had uh, all those things is is in really kind of incredible and pretty pretty unique and as far as people debating whether he was truly espousing the ideas of the or promoting the ideas of the french revolution of equality to me listen if that kind of if you name yourself supreme lord emperor or whatever like that kind of undermines all of that to me i don't think he ever really truly believed in those ideas i think they served him at, at a particular point so he went with it but i i don't think he you know he ever truly believed in those because if you're going to be a dictator and name yourself emperor that goes against the idea of equality and, and you know having a true de democracy in a republic you're a dictator right he established a, what essentially was a totalitarian government and then whether or not he was you know power hungry or just defending france against the other monarchs i think it was obviously a little bit of both i do think he was he had his head got big he was power hungry he wanted to rule the world or whatever and i, I do think that was part of his story uh but yeah uh great great series uh that was really interesting learning about napoleon i'm surprised that when he lost they didn't kill him they just kind of you know they didn't just chop his head off they isolated him away which i guess you know in certain ways it could have been worse for him after you know it's hard to go from being absolute ruler of the world to now you're in some island and you have no power and and you're just you know off somewhere and it's hilarious how they buried him in like four different coffins because you know they just wanted to make sure that he never came back again like he was like he was a, a the undead like a vampire boy they were shook uh didn't want anything to do and but they could have just killed him off so but they had also all types of security they had two boats circling the island 24 hours a day he was guarded by two thousand british soldiers like that's crazy uh, but yeah, great series. Uh, you know, don't know what the next one will be yet, but uh, we'll see. So you know, I'll catch you guys hopefully in the next one. So thank you guys for joining me and checking this one out with me as always. Uh, I will catch you guys on the next one. Um, you know, not sure what's gonna be yet, but you know, we'll, we'll see. So with that, I'll leave you guys today. Thank you guys again, and um, you know, see you next time. Take it easy. Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day.